It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. Uh, speaker, my first set of questions to the Premier is regarding the critical pieces that we think were missing from the budget yesterday. Uh, as we all know, and, and maybe the Premier didn't get the memo, but the pandemic is still raging. In fact, today, 2,380 2, cases are being reported in Ontario. This means people are still hurting. Folks are still in crisis. Those frontline health care, or rather those frontline essential workers uh, in hotspot communities particularly, are still facing the third wave of the pandemic, although that word, third wave, uh, those two words rather, didn't show up in yesterday's budget at all. But it's a serious matter, Speaker, because the budget did not include paid sick days for those essential frontline heroes. Why? Would the government not include paid sick days for those workers when virtually every expert has indicated that that's exactly the right thing for Ontario to do? Minister of Finance and President of the Treasury Board to respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Leader of the Opposition and the member opposite for that question. Mr. Speaker, uh, there is a program. There is a federal program. This program is working. 250,000 Ontarians have benefited from this program. There's over $700 million still available for that program. And every province in this country is benefiting from this program. So I call on the Leader of the Opposition to join us to make every Ontarian aware of this program so that they can get tested and, if they need to, isolate in one of the many isolation centres that we have put in this province so people can quarantine, Mr. Speaker. And let me tell you this. The number one combatant against the, uh, against the pandemic is vaccinations. Join us in making sure that every Ontarian who wants a vaccine gets one. Thank you. The supplementary question. I'm off to go get the vaccine, Speaker. Look, the other critical piece that was absolutely shocking when I looked at that budget yesterday was the fact that the survivors of the long-term care system saw no hope in that budget for urgent action to fix our long-term care system. And you know what? This government has no, shown no urgency whatsoever. In the first wave, there was no urgency to save people's lives and fix long-term care. Then the second wave came, and again, the government showed no urgency. In fact, more people lost their lives in the second wave in long-term care, shamefully, than in the first wave, tragically. That's what happened here in Ontario. And yet this budget shows no investment for uh, more RQIs, resident quality inspections, no increase, no permanent increase in the salaries uh, of PSWs, no necessity for the, way, uh, the working conditions to improve to full-time work for PSWs, no getting the profits out of long-term care. Why did the budget fail our long-term care system? Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, thank you again for that question. Uh, let me uh, remind the Speaker that uh, when uh, the Leader of the Opposition supported the Liberal government in the minority, I don't think the word urgent was in her playbook, and I'll tell you why. They built 611 beds in that time, over almost a decade. Mr. Speaker, urgent is in our playbook. That's why we're building 20,000. Over 20,000 have already been allocated new bed spaces of the 30,000. That's urgent. In fact, we're doing rapid builds to have them built, some of them built by the end of this year, Mr. Speaker. In terms of the quality of care, four hours of standard of care, Mr. Speaker, the gold standard in Canada. And you know what? We're not waiting. We're already recruiting PSWs. We're having in-class training and training in long-term care homes so we can retain them, recruit them, and motivate them for great careers in the per personal support worker yeah. sector. Thank you. Final supplementary. Here's the other thing that we were really quite um, disappointed and, in fact, you know, I increasingly worried uh, about what's missing from that budget, and that's the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of Ontarians that are waiting for surgeries, that are waiting for screenings, that are waiting for various procedures, and, and they're worried, and they're in pain. Some of them have cancer spreading through their body, and this government in this budget did not invest significantly in clearing that backlog. Other provinces have. In fact, British Columbia started planning last spring for the, the, the clearing of their backlog, and they're actually going to clear their backlog uh, by the summer. Not so in Ontario. 
Why did the government turn their backs on all of those folks who are suffering Order. and not include in the budget a significant Order. amount of investment and a, an appropriate plan Question. with targets to get rid of the surgical backlog in our province? Mr. Mr. Speaker, thank you again uh, to the member opposite for that question. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, listen, number one, uh, all the great people that have supported uh, this province through the uh, pandemic, including our uh, frontline uh, health care workers, nurses, personal support workers, physicians, people to support them, incredible heroes. But let me tell you this, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure the Leader of the Opposition has read the budget. And I'll tell you why. We've put unprecedented amounts, long overdue amounts, into our health care system, building hospitals, putting in money for our long-term care, putting money in for mental health and addiction. And, Mr. Speaker, in that budget, we also highlight the substantive amount of monies in addition to the backlog for surgeries that we put in before, another $300 million through the great leadership of our Minister of Health. And we're going to clear up that backlog, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks so much, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier, but in that budget is about a third uh, per capita of what other provinces are investing in getting rid of their right. surgical backlog, Speaker, so uh, I don't know why this government can't do that math. However, um, the budget also confirmed yesterday uh, that um, we're going to be seeing more cuts to schools. We're going to be seeing more caring adults removed from our school system uh, in our province, almost a billion dollars in cuts to education. So my question is exactly how many how many educators, how many teachers, how many educational support workers is this government planning to fire this time? Minister Panaev. Um, Mr. Speaker, I thank you again for the from the leader of the opposition for that question. Uh, you know, if if you look at the budget, we increase education spending. And spending is going up every single year through our plan. Mr. Speaker, we've heard from parents and we've heard from people right across the province that the most important thing is to bring our children back to school safely. We invested $1.6 billion to do that, and they're very grateful for that. But, Mr. Speaker, we're not going to rest. We're going to continue to invest in making sure students can be safely in school, and we've put in additional money so that they can uh, learn. Uh, online, remotely, in sur underserved uh, communities, because there's nothing worse than in a lockdown, being doing your school online, and the bandwidth isn't there. So we're making historic, record investments in broadband, so we can connect every single student in this province. Yeah. And the supplementary. Speaker, school boards in our province are already planning for layoffs. In fact, Ottawa School Board just sent a memo that 167 positions uh, are going to be cut. The government sent a memo uh, just about a month ago telling school boards to prepare for cuts and firings of staff. So my question is, after a year of upheaval, after a year of the most difficult year our students have ever seen, why would this government think that now is the time to pull supports away instead of making sure that our kids are shored up and that we have the educational workers, the, the teachers, the, uh, you know, the mental health supports that every student needs and deserves to get over this nightmare of a year that they've had to endure? Minister of Education, your part. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Ontario's action plan that was unveiled by the Minister of Finance yesterday confirms a $700 million net increase in public education. There is no government in the history of this province, in the first year of our mandate, the second year of our mandate, and in this coming fiscal year, that has invested more than the Premier Doug Ford. We are committed to ensuring investments continue to rise. It's why we're putting more money in the skilled trades, more money in summer learning, the largest summer learning program, or $100 million to mitigate learning loss. It's why we're supporting internet connection at every school and right across the province of Ontario to end the digital divide in this province. We are investing in all realms, in mental health, in learning laws, and I acknowledge to the Leader of the Opposition that we are going to be providing more support through the Grant for Student Needs, which is the principal vehicle of funding to school boards, which will be released in the coming months, a commitment by the government to continue to invest in safe schools and in quality education in Ontario. And the final supplementary. Earth to the government, earth to the Minister of Education. Schools are still closing today in Ontario. We're in a third wave. There's 2,380 2, new cases being reported today. 
There is still a crisis upon us. The pandemic has not ended here in Ontario. Students need supports now more probably than they ever have before in their educational careers. So why does the government just not get it? Why are they so out of touch? Why is the government firing teachers, educational workers, supports to students at the Order. very time that those students need the help the most? Education. Mr. Speaker, what is out of touch is the Leader of the Opposition's dismissal of money directly in the pockets of working parents in this province to attack the Minister of Finance for believing that a billion dollars in direct financial relief is not a merited investment of tax dollars suggests that you are out of touch, respectfully, ma'am. The government is fully committed to investing in quality education to reduce— well, You've got to make your remarks through the chair, not across the floor. Please conclude your answer. It underscores the truth that the government is investing in quality learning in safe schools while also returning monies directly to moms and dads' pockets. We're doing this through a child care relief, a 20 per cent top-up. In addition to direct supports, $400 per child up to grade 12, $500 per child with special education needs up to age 21. That is a real commitment to helping taxpayers and parents Response? and a real commitment to protecting our schools in this province. Next question. A member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, moments ago, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled against the Premier, and this question is directed to the Premier, and his Conservative campaign against action on the climate crisis. To quote the court, climate change is real, and it poses a grave threat to humanity's future. After years of wasted time and millions spent in losing court battles, is the Premier prepared to admit he was wrong? and to stop attacking efforts to fight the climate crisis. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks to respond. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thanks for the member opposite for that question. And you know what we have done since day one of being elected, and what we'll continue to do is continue to continue to fight for affordability for families and small businesses throughout this province. Now we don't we don't disagree that climate change is a threat to this province and to this country, Mr. Speaker. We want the same things that everyone wants. Reduce our GHG emissions, protect our air, land, and water. We want a strong climate plan. However, Mr. Speaker, we want to take a different path. We believe there's a different path moving forward to achieve our goals, Mr. Speaker, and it's not necessarily what the member of the opposites are pushing, Mr. Speaker. We think that we can move forward to reduce our GHG emissions, achieve our targets, but at the same time protect our air, land, and, and water. And, and what we've moved forward with, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say is we have our first ever strategy on hydrogen Response. going forward with this government, Mr. Speaker. We have our emissions reduction for heavy-duty vehicles going forward, and we have our emissions performance standards, which we are working with the federal government to implement in order to uh, attack those heavy polluters in this province and reduce their emissions. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Again, back to the Premier. We need a Green New Democratic deal to fight climate change and build a sustainable Ontario. The government lost at the appeals court. They lost at the Supreme Court. They wasted money putting stickers on gas pumps to show just how angry they were. And those stickers didn't even stick. But anger won't address the climate crisis. Only real action will. This is a government that wants to pave over wetlands to build warehouses and calls carbon pricing a green scam. When will they wake up? When will they smell the coffee and start tackling the climate crisis the way Ontarians want them to? Thank you. Minister of the Environment. Thanks again. Thanks again for that supplemental uh, from the member opposite, Mr. Speaker. And what we do believe is that we're able to have a balance between a healthy, strong environment and a healthy economy. Through that healthy economy, we can put more efforts behind uh, fighting climate change. We put more efforts protecting our land, air, and water. But just for the members opposite, uh, just to continue, not only have we introduced Ontario's first hydrogen strategy consultation, have our climate change advisory panel reporting soon, Mr. Speaker, we also are doing an impact assessment across this province for climate change to see how uh, we can build resilience and change uh, through communities throughout the province to prepare for the changes due to climate change. We've increased the renewable content of gasoline, Mr. Speaker, and we are going to be moving forward with phasing out the total use of coal with in this province, something that wasn't completed from the previous government, something that was started originally by the previous 
Progressive Conservative government that is going to be finalized by a Progressive Conservative government, Response? Mr. Speaker. We are going to continue our investment of $30 million into wetlands and our $20 million green uh, land partnership program as we move forward to protect our land, air and water and fight climate change, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, as you know, my community of Scarborough Aging Court has been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. Scarborough is home to more than 600,000 people, and we need significant investments in health care services to support our community and continue to stop the spread of COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Finance introduced the government's 2021 budget. Would the minister please tell this House exactly what our government is investing to stop the spread of COVID-19? Minister Finance. Well, thank you to the uh, member for Sca uh, Scarborough Agent Court for that question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I said yesterday, you can't have a healthy economy without healthy people. For the past year, we have focused on protecting people from COVID-19, but many challenges still lie ahead. With vaccines being distributed in every quarter of the province, hope is on the horizon. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to take every necessary step to protect the people of this province against the COVID-19 virus. That's why our 2021 budget, Ontario's Action Plan Protecting People's Health and Our Economy, brings Ontario's total investment to protect people's health since the start of the pandemic to $16.3 billion. Mr. Speaker, while the Liberals spent 15 years ignoring the health care needs of this province, this government is making the investments the people of Ontario deserve. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplementary question is to the Minister of Health. This is great news for my community. I know everyone will be very excited to hear about this investment to keep Ontarians healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic. Expanded health care is exactly what Scarborough needs. Mr. Speaker, would the Minister of Health explain exactly what this year's investments mean for expanding health care in Ontario? Thank you. Mr. Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Scarborough Aging Court for his question and for your very effective advocacy for your constituents. Our government continues to take every action necessary to stop the spread of the COVID-19 virus while making record investments in the health care system. Mr. Speaker, this means an increase in base funding for health care in Ontario to $64 billion this year. That's up 4.7 per cent from last year's investment. Anthony Dale from the Ontario Hospital Association said, that he greatly appreciates the investments announced today and thanks the Government of Ontario for providing hospitals with additional financial resources in an effort to maintain stability during this ongoing crisis. Mr. Speaker, our government will continue to make record investments in our health care system so that patients can receive high-quality care in their own communities. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Uh, we need to talk about the Ontario Small Business Support Grant. Since it was launched, my colleagues and I have talked to countless frustrated small business owners who never qualified to even apply for the grant. The grant criteria is too narrow. Thousands of businesses have been told, you're just out of luck. We're talking about family-owned businesses, dry cleaners, brewers, caterers, electricians, and more. They were desperately hoping to see expanded criteria for the grant in yesterday's budget, a call echoed by the Ontario Chamber of Commerce and CFIB, so that all affected businesses could receive some, some support. Instead, they were left out again. Will the minister do the right thing, level the playing field so that all businesses can receive this much needed support? Mr. Finance. Well, thank you to the member opposite for the question. You know, Mr. Speaker, uh, the small businesses in our great province, uh, they're really the economic engine uh, for this province, but they're more than that. They're the identity of many of our communities, and uh, they've suffered quite a lot. So that's why we launched the Ontario Small Business Grant Program. Uh, that 
affects uh, over 100,000 uh, businesses that have applied successfully for the grant. We expect 120,000. We are supporting those who are affected by the lockdown and restricted significantly. And I'm pleased to announce yesterday that we were doubling that because that's often the difference between keeping the lights on and turning them off for good. But we went further than that. For those even harder hit in our tourism, in our travel, in our hospitality industry, where we announced over $400 million of additional supports on top of the over $200 million. Mr. Speaker, this, party, this government stands Fine. behind small business, and we'll, we were there for them before, we were there for them yesterday, and we'll be there for them tomorrow. Please supplementary question. Uh, Speaker, yesterday evening on the agenda, a small business owner was asked to rate the Premier's performance on the small business file. She said, am I giving him a grade? It wouldn't be a good one. She called the assistance thus far pathetic. Today, one in six small businesses are at risk of closing. The average debt that these businesses face are $170,000. Many need more support than what is being offered them to get offered to them to get through this third wave. We have 2,400 cases in the, in, today in the province of Ontario. What does the minister have to say to small business owners who are rightfully disappointed by yesterday's budget? What hope can you offer when you fail to recognize the turmoil they have faced during this pandemic? Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate uh, the question from the member opposite. We have spent the last months listening to small business owners and speaking to them and listening about their concerns, Mr. Speaker. That is why the Minister of Finance initially launched the Small Business Support Grant, up to $20,000 grant to support their needs. Over 100,000 applications, over $1.4 billion have been paid out, and yesterday the Minister of Finance announced that he is doubling that payment, Mr. Speaker. We are going to continue to support our small businesses who have faced significant challenges. We're giving them 100 percent of their property tax to be covered, 100 percent of their energy costs that are also being covered. If they go to the federal programs, they can get up to 90 percent of their rent relief and wage, uh, wage assistance up to 75 percent. Response? We will uh, spare no expense in ensuring that small businesses continue to receive the support they need to get through this difficult time. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Vandy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Park. Mr. Speaker, this government has demonstrated repeatedly that fighting climate change is not a priority. From eliminating powers of conservation authorities to making ministerial zoning orders untouchable, this government continues to put our environment at risk. Another demonstration of this lies in the budget which makes no major financial commitments for reducing emissions with no clear targets and no plan for green COVID-19 recovery. Today's Supreme Court ruling on the carbon tax tells us that this government invested millions of taxpayers' money in a misplaced priority, fighting against protecting the environment. So my question that I would like to ask is, why won't this government take climate change seriously and proactively protect our environment for the generations to come. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thanks again uh, from the member from that uh, the question from the member opposite. And uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, unlike the party opposite, uh, we believe in affordability of lives for small businesses and people at home. We, we base our decisions knowing that we can fight climate change, we can have a safe a clean environment while also balancing out the, uh, the economy, Mr. Speaker, and that is how we're going to move together as a province. Our goals aren't any different than members opposite of ensuring that we reach our targets of 30 percent below uh, 2030 uh, uh, target, 30 uh, percent below 2005 levels, Mr. Speaker. Um, we have made numerous programs coming forward to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, and I know uh, the member opposite uh, probably wasn't here at the start of the session, and maybe she's missed out on some of those uh, uh, programs that we put Response? forward, but I, she has to agree that the hydrogen strategy, the first ever in Ontario that we're coming forward with, is a strong strategy that is going to lead to zero emission uh, uh, vehicles. It's going to reduce emissions with our trains, emissions of buses, help us store Thank you. excess energy. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We know that this past year, 
has been very challenging for so many Ontarians. And what they need right now is for their government to stand for them with needed support. Yet, real investments are missing for much needed personal support workers, people that depend on the insufficient support of the Ontario Disability Support Program, mothers who were forced to leave the workforce, students, small businesses, and so many more. Our youth deserves a government that will prioritize fighting for their future and fighting against climate change. Will the government apologize to Ontario taxpayers for wasting so much money to support an anti-environment agenda? Minister of Finance. Well, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member opposite for that question. You know, uh, you know we're doing a lot to protect the environment. Uh, I'll start with some investments that we're making in uh, electric vehicles. Uh, we participated in, in investments at the Ford plant in Oakville to be the largest manufacturer of electric vehicles in Ontario. Uh, that investment will help our critical miner minerals industry as well and battery-operated uh, facilities because we want to be a, a leader in electric vehicles in this province, Mr. Speaker. In addition, I can tell you as the Minister of Finance, Ontario has issued more green bonds to finance more green projects than any other province in all of Canada. In fact, Mr. Speaker, 27 projects, some $9 billion of green bonds. What that means, these are projects that Response. reduce gas emissions, uh, carbon emissions, Mr. Speaker, get cars off the load like transit, invest in new technologies, as the Minister of Environment said, water, parks, and so on. And we'll continue to make those investments, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question. Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, the Minister of Finance released the government's 2021 budget. The minister has mentioned some impressive investments in health care and for small businesses. In my riding and across the province, parents and families have been some of the hardest hit by the pandemic. Over the last year, I have heard from countless parents in my riding who are struggling with the stress and costs of supporting their children's education. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell the House what supports for families and children this government has put forward in our 2021 budget? Minister Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member from Anglington Lawrence for that question. The member is right, uh, Mr. Speaker. Parents and families need our support, especially now as we continue to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Speaker, the budget is making good on our commitment to do whatever it takes to keep people safe. It also builds on significant support for families, workers and employers that have been made available since the beginning of the pandemic. That is why the government's 2021 budget proposes doubling of the support for families and support for learners programs. Mr. Speaker, now every eligible parent could receive a one-time payment of $400 for children up to grade 12 and $500 for children up to 21 with special needs. Mr. Speaker, hope is on the horizons. It's months not years away. Until then, we will maintain our unwavering commitment to protect the people of Ontario. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This pandemic has been challenging for families and communities across the province. I know our government has provided record investments to school boards, allowing students to be in class safely and helping to keep schools open. Mr. Speaker, we have done this because we know that students need to be in school learning alongside their peers. This is critical for the development, for mental health, and for future success. Our investments have been pivotal, pivotal sorry, in preventing transmission in schools, and they have helped to keep students, staff, and families safe. As our government continues to support school boards, can the Minister of Education please explain why it is so important that we also put money directly into the pockets of parents? Minister of Education. Thank you. I want to thank the member from Eglinton Lawrence for her advocacy on behalf of taxpayers because, as progressive Conservatives, we believe it is critical. We continue to provide direct financial support to the parents of this province who have worked so hard and sacrificed every step of the way. Yes, we are providing $700 million more in the budget specifically for public education. Yes, we are going to be unveiling more supports, mental health supports, learning loss supports, spec ed supports, specific to dealing with September to ensure we have a safe restart. 
But we also believe, in addition to investing in public education, investing in parents, providing an additional billion dollars in their pockets to the Ontario COVID-19 child benefit, as announced by the Minister of Finance, $400 per child up to grade 12, $500 for a child with special education needs, because it underscores our government's commitment to supporting parents to make sure we defeat this pandemic and we recover stronger than ever before. The next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For years now, Brampton has made it very clear we need a standalone, brand new hospital for Brampton. And we need it to meet the growing needs of our city of over 600,000 people and the healthcare crisis. And despite years of demanding this, the Conservative government in the Premier's 2021 budget has left Brampton behind once again. There's no commitment to build a fully independent hospital. There's no money and no timelines for any work on Peel Memorial and, shockingly, no emergency room, and there's no acknowledgement for any funding for Brampton Civic, Brampton's only hospital that has been chronically overcrowded and underfunded. This budget is a slap in the face of Brampton, and it shows something very clear, that the Premier doesn't care about Brampton. When will this Conservative government start giving Brampton the respect that we deserve, and that means making sure our city has three hospitals and three ERs. Will the Premier commit to doing that for our city today? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed many gaps and vulnerabilities in our health care system caused by many 15 years of neglect. This is particularly true for the health care sector in Peel Region. That's why our revised capital plan includes an investment of $30.2 billion over the next 10 years in new hospital infrastructure to build, expand, and renew hospitals across Ontario so people can receive the care they need close to home. So, as part of our 2021 budget, we are committed to the transforming the Peel Memorial Hospital for Integrated Health and Wellness in Brampton from an urgent care centre into a new hospital with a 24 7 patient. <laughs> Patient, inpatient wing. This project will significantly increase bed capacity in Brampton, and by Response. consolidating post-acute inpatient services at the new hospital, we will create additional capacity for acute care services at the Brampton Civic School. Thank you. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Premier. Thank you, Speaker. Once again, back to the Premier. People in Brampton have made it very clear. We need investment in our broken health care system. That means funding for Brampton Civic. That means building an additional hospital, and that means converting Peel Memorial from a hospital, from a healthcare centre, into a hospital. But the Premier's budget has no money allocated for Peel Memorial, no timeline, and most shockingly, no emergency room. The 2021 budget is a disgrace, and it shows how little respect this Premier has for the people of Brampton. The Premier has not any money committed in the budget towards the construction of a new hospital and gives no details as when, when we can expect to see one. So I want to be very, very clear in my question to the Premier Speaker. Will the Premier commit today to converting Peel Memorial from a health care centre to a hospital with an emergency room? Will he commit to building an additional hospital in our city? And will he commit to properly funding Brampton Civic, a, city, a, a hospital that has been overcrowded and, and underfunded for years? Well, need to respond. It's the most exciting day for the people of Brampton in decades. For 15 years, the NDP and the Liberals ignored the people of Brampton. Well, I have a message for the people of Brampton. You don't have to worry anymore. You're going to have a 24-7 emergency room. We're going to have a brand new hospital there. But what bothers me is how that member neglected, ignored his Order. own constituents, and the NDP backed the Liberals for 15 years, and they put a little clinic there, 9 to 5. We're going to have 24-7 operating hospital, a brand new one, and they can spin it any way they want, but I can't wait to get there, get the shovels in the ground, and start getting this built, because the people of Brampton have been waiting way too long. Under Bunch. the NDP and the Liberals, the PC government is actually building a brand new hospital for the people of Brampton. The next question. The member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 
Speaker, his government's record on climate change has been costly and destructive. Cancelling Ontario's successful cap-and-trade market-driven program, spending $30 million to fight the federal carbon tax, which the Supreme Court of Canada just struck down, spending $231 million to cancel green energy projects and jobs, ripping up electric vehicle charging stations, selling off the green belt to friends, bypassing the environmental protections through the abuse of MZOs, and, finding, and fining small business owners tens of thousands of dollars for refusing to display anti-climate stickers, which the courts have also deemed unconstitutional and a misuse of a governing party's legislative power. Question. Speaker, through you to the Premier, how would you vote? Does the members of your party recognize that climate change as an existential crisis that our scientists have described is real. Again, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks to respond. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite for that question. And, uh, you know, I stated earlier in question period that uh, we, we do, uh, uh, we don't disagree that climate change isn't a serious threat to this province. What we do uh, believe in is that the fact that we can move forward to protect our land, air, and water, and protect and fight against climate change in a balanced manner, protecting the environment and the economy at the same time. Mr. Speaker, that member opposite and her party for 15 years, economic policies drove this province into the ground. Businesses fled, 300,000 jobs left, small businesses closed. They destroyed farmland throughout this province and. They cut up and sold up the green belt, Mr. Speaker. We're not doing that, Mr. Speaker. We have a plan moving forward that's going to put $30 million into our wetlands to restore them, $20 million to protect more land working with Nature Conservancy of Canada. And Mr. Speaker, we're first for, for the decades, we are expanding the green belt through consultation, something that member and that party never did. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. Supplementary. Which I represent the Liberal Party of Ontario created the green belt and at a time when we led the OECD countries in economic growth. So, Speaker, my question back to the government is, Ontario's budget yesterday was supposed to bring hope for the people of Ontario. Unfortunately, what, what they got was a budget that fell far short. And this is, in tru this is truly unprecedented times, yet this budget is abandoning the people of Ontario. In fact, Speaker, we don't know what else is hidden in this budget as we're still going through it. We remember the last time Question. you tabled a budget and you implemented Schedule 6, which was a threat to conservation authorities, destroying very valuable wetlands. So, Speaker, what why did this government not include a climate recovery, a green recovery, in their budget yesterday? Why did you miss that opportunity? Thank you. Minister of the Environment. Well, thanks. thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, Ontario has our Made in Ontario Environment Plan that's going to protect the land, air, and water, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, we're moving forward to fight climate change and reduce our emissions to hit our Paris Agreement targets of 30 percent below 2005 levels, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite uh, uh, continues to uh, shout out to us, Mr. Speaker, but I know she wants to hear my answer. She wants to know that we're moving forward with the first-ever hydrogen strategy in this province, which is going to create a new economy of low-carbon Low emission uh, energy. It's going to be able to store energy, Mr. Speaker. It's going to be able to reduce our, our GHG emissions through natural gas with a mixture of, of hydrogen. It's going to create the ability for trains and buses and trucks to move towards hydrogen powered uh, uh, trend, uh, engines to move forward, Mr. Speaker. We are going to finalize the phase out of coal, Response. something the member opposite's party refused to do in the 15 years that they're in power. We are going to finalize the ending of coal in industry throughout this province, Mr. Speaker, and we're investing $30 million into wetlands. And 20 million in the Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, my question is to the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, businesses in my riding are struggling. Small business owners I have spoken to understand and respect that we need to protect our health care system capacity and save lives, but it doesn't change the fact that many are still struggling to pay bills, pay staff 
and keep going with important public health restrictions still in place. Just yesterday, the Minister of Finance introduced the government's 2021 budget. Mr. Speaker, I would like to know what is in the budget for small businesses in, in my riding of Oakville and indeed throughout the province of Ontario, which continue to struggle financially while doing their part to fight the spread of COVID-19. Would the Minister of Finance please tell us what is in the 2021 budget so that I can take back this information to the hardworking business owners in my riding? Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you to the member for that question. And uh, Mr. Speaker, we have lots of great news, not only for the members, constituents, but every single member in this House's constituents. Let me tell you, and I want to quote uh, the CFIB, since the member opposite raised it. CFIB is pleased, and I quote, to see a much needed boost to the Ontario Small Business Grant Program. By, by adding a second round of funding, this will help thousands of businesses hard hit by uh, uh, the uh, extended lockdowns and restrictions. Now, the OCC, uh, this is what they had to say, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. Ontario's business community welcomes the 2021 budget, which gives businesses much needed supports to s confront the current health crisis while laying the foundation for a strong and inclusive economic recovery. Ontario's 2021 budget will uh, hit the, help the hardest sectors, including new funding for uh, aid for women who have been deeply impacted by the pandemic, and initiatives related to tourism, training, and broadband infrastructure that will enable a strong economic recovery, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's great news for uh, all the small businesses throughout Ontario and in, and in my writing. My second question is to the uh, Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Automatic second payments for small businesses support grants will provide the support that small businesses in my writing need. Mr. Speaker, we can't take a one-size-fits-all approach. Some businesses need rent relief, some need make, help making payroll, and some need help adapting to be open with new restrictions. Mr. Speaker, can the minister clarify how this injection of financial support can be utilized? Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, to the member opposite for being a strong advocate for small businesses and the Minister of Finance for his advocacy and support of small businesses in this budget. Protecting Ontario's economy starts with protecting our small businesses, and the, that's exactly what yesterday's budget has done. Ontarians can rest assured that our government has and will continue to be there to support our small businesses. This grant is designed with feedback directly from our businesses to increase flexibility so businesses can use it to meet their unique needs, whether it's to, to fund or maintain inventory, uh, an investment in a website, or some extra help to cover some wages. We want small businesses across Ontario to decide what they need and what works for them best. Nobody knows small businesses better than those small businesses. And that's why our government is going to double the support through the Small Business Support Grant with an automatic payment to respond to small business owners who are struggling and need more help. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you. Um, good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The government's budget falls woefully short of what our long-term care system needs to deliver the quality of care our seniors deserve in communities like Brampton and other parts of Ontario. This government is still refusing to instate a permanent wage increase for personal support workers, nor does it commit to reinstating comprehensive resident quality inspections. As experts indicate, there, these are both simple ways and effective ways that we can ensure that the horrors that have occurred in our long-term care homes over the pandemic never happen again. Speaker, why is this government refusing to listen to Ontario's long-term care experts? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. It's it's undeniable that. Uh, uh, the cracks in long-term care were exposed by COVID-19 and the many years of neglect of this sector were exposed. But our government is repairing and rebuilding long-term care in Ontario like never before. And we didn't get here overnight. Uh, Budget 2021 is a major step forward with unprecedented investments. We are spending more than $9.6 in new dollars. 
uh, dollars that the Liberals and the NDP never spent. And that is what the opposition should be explaining to Ontarians. $4.9 billion over the next four years to reach a standard of an average of four hours per day per, uh, per resident in long-term care. This is going to make Ontario a leader in the, in the country, and we are committed to doing this, and that budget demonstrated that. $246 million to improve living conditions in long-term care homes creating 27,000 new positions for long-term care, PSWs and nurses, $2.6 billion to support building and redeveloping 30,000 new spaces. All of this Response. is part of repairing and rebuilding and advancing long-term care, something that the previous government, supported by the NDP, never did. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, the government is failing to recognize the value of PSWs in our province with a permanent wage increase. The budget actually provides cash incentives for these PSWs, and I think this is a really important point. The, this budget is providing a cash incentive for PSWs to leave long-term care homes that desperately need them and move to four profit providers and retirement homes. Shame on this government. This government claims it has hired 8,600 workers in long-term care, but it's not clear how and where these workers will be allocated. In fact, Speaker, what we see this government do is offer $5,000 cash incentives for these PSWs to work in those for-profit retirement homes. Why is this government diverting staff away from long-term care homes and recruiting them to for-profit care providers? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Once again, you know, the, the crisis in long-term care, the staffing crisis was many years in the making. It happened under the previous government, supported by the NDP, and it are, is our government that has, has 17,000, over 17,000 uh, workers in the pipeline, including the 8,636 that we are able to hire with the pandemic pay, and then our, our monumental, historic a commitment of accumulating $1.9 billion uh, to, to create the staffing required, 27,000 new hires that will, will be required, and our, our 24 public colleges with uh, 8,200 uh, positions that are ongoing, 2,000 of those are already in the pipeline. These, this staff will be graduating and ready to work in our sector uh, by the fall. This is monumental, Order. historic commitment by this Response. government. It is our Conservative the government government that will prepare long-term care. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Supreme Court this morning confirmed what we all knew. The Premier's lawsuit against climate carbon pricing was a complete waste of taxpayer dollars. Since day one, this government has wasted taxpayer dollars on partisan lawsuits, stickers that don't stick, and canceling contracts. Even the Auditor General has said that the government's made-to-fail environment plan will not reduce climate pollution. So, Speaker, my question for the Premier is, will the Premier stop wasting our hard-earned tax dollars sabotaging climate solutions and actually start investing in urgent climate action? Mr. Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thanks uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for that question. And uh, you know, I, I've said this from the start: uh, we're, we're not disagreeing that climate change is, is, is not a threat to this province or this country, and we are taking measures forward with our Made in Ontario Environment Plan, Mr. Speaker. There's, we all want the same results at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker. We all want a clean environment. We want safe water to drink. We want protected lands. We want air that's quality to breathe, and we want to make sure that we reduce our emissions to the targets that we set forth of this government, uh, Mr. Speaker and that we signed on with the federal government with regards to a Paris climate reduction. And, Mr. Speaker, we're, we're just doing that. We just don't believe we have the same path as, a, uh, as the member opposite has moving forward. We believe in a balance between a healthy, strong economy and a healthy, strong environment, Mr. Speaker. And I, I'm looking forward to this year as we implement our emissions performance standards to those heavy polluters, those heavy polluters in this province, uh, uh, as has been approved by the federal government. This, this program is going to move forward to lower their emissions, Response. but also keeping them competitive to keep jobs in this country and to ensure that we can grow our economy and protect our economy and get our targets down to the levels we need it to be. Mr. Supplementary question. Speaker, all day today the minister has said we're about protecting air, land and water. Well, let's look at the record and let's look at what citizens of this province have said. 
two and a half years ago when they tried to open the Greenbelt for development, I was a leading voice in this legislature that got them to back off on doing that. More recently, when they wanted to pave over the Duffins Creek wetland, citizens spoke out, and I was a leading voice in this House, and now they backed off on that. Citizens are speaking out against Highway 413, which is going to supercharge sprawl, pave over farmland and parts of the Greenbelt, and we're going to stop that too, Speaker. That is the record. So, Speaker, the government has an opportunity right now to remove Schedule 3 from Bill 257, which would allow them to completely disregard the provincial policy statement. Question. If the minister is serious about protecting land and wetlands and farmland in this province, will they remove Schedule 3 from Bill 257? And the Minister of the Environment. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And this government has a proud history on our environment plan going forward since 2018. Mr. Speaker, we move forward to give municipalities a say again how they deal with their land with regards to green energy projects. Something that member did not support, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we move forward with uh, uh, municipalities having a say where to site landfills, Mr. Speaker, so that they could protect their land locally that they needed to be protected, Mr. Speaker. We've invested uh, $20 million in our, our Greenland Partnership Program with Nature Conservancy of Canada to protect and conserve land throughout this province. We've put $30 million, Mr. Speaker, towards wetlands restoration and protection, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, we are consulting now on the biggest expansion of the green belt in decades, Mr. Speaker. We're going to protect more green, green belt land, Mr. Speaker. I am proud of the, uh, uh, the environment policy that we put forth in addition to our hydrogen strategy, our emissions reduction with heavy-duty vehicles, and our emissions performance standards, Mr. Speaker. We're well on our way to achieving our goal of 30 percent below 2005 levels in 2030, Mr. Speaker. Next, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Premier knows that we need economic growth in this province, but he seems to have forgotten that without meaningful action on the childcare crisis, a full economic recovery is impossible. We're in the midst of a she session with, with women suffering majority of job losses during the pandemic. We don't just need any recovery, we need a she recovery, and we can't achieve that without affordable childcare. Why is this government refusing to increase funding for childcare and invest in the system we need? Mr. Finance. Well, thank you to the member opposite for that question. You know, as I mentioned in my speech yesterday, you know, I've been surrounded by incredible women in my life, very fortunate, uh, including my grandmother who came from Europe during World War II, who came to this country uh, with bombs and bullets overhead uh, and, uh, and came to this country. And Ontario has afforded so much to her uh, in her life, and she was a teacher. Um, I really understand, and my government, uh, our government understands how important the leadership of women have been through this crisis and how women need to be part of the recovery. So childcare is an important part of that, and that's why we've struck a task force with the minister, associate minister of women and children, and myself, Order. to hear from all women to make sure that our economic recovery Response. is inclusive and works with all the incredible women in this province. Thank you. A supplementary question. Speaker, this budget does not solve the problem of Ontario having the highest childcare fees in the country. It does nothing for families struggling to find space for their child. Last year, for the first time in a decade, more childcare centres closed than opened in this province, a net loss of 58 childcare centres. Why does this budget have no plan to control fees and create the desperately needed new childcare spaces? Mr. Mr. Speaker, thank you. thank you very much for the very important question from the member opposite. Mr. Speaker, uh, as I outlined in the budget yesterday, uh, we are creating, uh, we've created the uh, support for learners, support for families, Ontario Child COVID uh, benefit, child benefit, uh, immediate money into the pockets of the many families, mothers and fathers in this province with, with, province with children, Order. zero to uh, grade 12. Immediately, that's doubling what we did before. Mr. Speaker, we uh, doubled the uh, child care tax credit to put more money into the pockets of those families for expenses such as child care. 
We're continuing on our pledge to build 30,000 new child care spaces. We've already uh, announced and built 20,000, including in my riding of Pickering. And the first public school, thank you, uh, Minister, the first public school in 20 years in Pickering, including 85 child care spaces. Mr. Speaker, this is Response. very important to our government. It's very important to me, and we have a lot more to do on this. And we'll do it together. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of the Environment. Just a few years ago, I stood with him and many of our Conservative colleagues when the previous leader announced the need to get serious about climate change, and I quote, that the Ontario PCs will opt in to the federal carbon pricing benchmark rather than directly impose one of its own from the People's Guarantee. I still believe climate change is real. I still believe a price on carbon, on pollution, is needed. So, Mr. Speaker, why does the minister think a carbon tax was the right policy under Patrick Brown, but not under the current leader, the Premier, and why is he letting climate change deniers dictate policy? Mr. The Environment. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member opposite. Uh, she also uh, stood with us as a party and was elected on uh, our, our party's mandate to make life more affordable for families and small businesses, which was to remove the cap and trade and fight the carbon tax in this province. And we stood by our election promises and our mandate. We didn't walk away uh, from the party on, on that issue, Mr. Speaker. So what we have done, we've come forward with a Made in Ontario environment plan uh, that is going to take a, a path that we believe will get us towards our targets, which is going to protect land air and water, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are going to ensure that we reach our targets on climate change, and we have a number of initiatives that we put forward that that member supported uh, on this side of the House. And I look forward to implementing more measures going forward so that we will reach our target, protect our environment, and at the same time Fun. balance out and strengthen and grow our economy in this province, jobs, and make life affordable. For and the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In response to the Supreme Court ruling that the federal carbon pricing scheme is constitutional, the Minister of the Environment said this, and I quote, we are protecting our province's land, air, and water. Let's review this government's record on the environment. Cancelled the cap-and-trade program, spent $231 million cancelling green energy projects and jobs, axed the environmental commissioner, bypassed environmental protections and cut up the green belt through MCOs. Not sure how any of that protects our land, air, and water, but... Mr. Speaker, now that the Supreme Court has ruled against his Conservative government's partisan and costly court challenge, how can he and his government justify spending $30 million of taxpayer money on defending climate change deniers? Mr. The Environment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, thank the member opposite uh, for that question. And of course, remind the member that many of the items that she listed out, she voted and supported for in this House during this legislature, Mr. Speaker. But in addition, Mr. Speaker, we are moving forward with uh, a $20 million investment in the, uh, the uh, Greenlands Conservation Partner. We're going to work with Nature Conservancy Canada, Mr. Speaker, in order to uh, preserve and protect lands, Mr. Speaker. As the Finance Minister mentioned, we put a heavy investment into Ford Canada in order to transfer transform uh, their plant to producing electric vehicles, which is going to, in the long term, not only create a lot of jobs and stabilize Ford for Ontario for decades to come, it's also going to provide an opportunity to grow the economy and electric vehicle market, which at the end of the day will decrease greenhouse gases, will make uh, our targets uh, achievable, Mr. Speaker, and, at this end, it will also support uh, the land, air and water we are protecting in this, uh, this province, Mr. Speaker, and I'm proud. I'm proud of the, uh, the budget that the member of uh, finance put forward and our environmental plan. It is for the people of this province, and it's for a healthy he economy and a healthy environment. Thank you. The next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. A survey recently conducted by the San Romanoway Revitalization Association and Black Creek Community Health Centre found that at-risk seniors who are part of a group that meet regularly in the Jane and Finch area, most live in Toronto community housing and other nearby buildings, would get vaccinated if it was more accessible. There are many such groups in my community, as well as Toronto community housing buildings, each with several hundred seniors living there that have available space on site for mobile vaccination. Speaker, time is of the essence and could make a difference in saving lives. Will this government commit today to adequate mobile vaccinations in my community and work with local community partners as soon as possible? so at-risk seniors can get vaccinated. Let's get it done. 
Thank you, Speaker. Well, I can certainly agree with the, the member opposite. The time is of the essence. Time is of the essence to get more needles into more arms as soon as possible while the variants of concern are still out there and are increasing in our communities. What we really need is supply right now. We are operating. We uh, were able to do uh, yesterday 79,447 uh, injections and, of vaccines. That's really significant. We have the opportunity to double or quadruple that amount as soon as we have significant volumes of vaccines. We have received some Pfizer vaccines in. We're waiting for another shipment next week. We are going to be operating mass vaccination clinics. We are going to be expanding into more pharmacies. We are going to have more specialty clinics, more in primary care. We have plans to do that. We are ready to do that at a moment's notice as soon as we receive those vaccines. But that is what we are asking for from the federal government. As soon as we have them, we will be expanding into your community and into communities across Ontario because you're absolutely right. Time is of the essence. We need to get it done now. The supplementary member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. My question is also to the Minister of Health. Speaker, I still hear from constituents who have no idea whether or not they are eligible yet for their vaccines. Seniors who cannot properly navigate the complicated booking systems and folks having to wait for hours on the phone to register. I hear from families who are beyond concerned that their home. I'm, I'm talking about families across this province. I think the minister Order. should listen. The minister of, of uh, what energy should really listen. It's really heartbreaking Order. that we cannot get across the stories of our constituents in this house. I apologize to the member who has the floor. I can't hear the member who has the floor. And I invite her to place her question. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I hear from families who are beyond concerned that their homebound loved ones or those who have mobility issues cannot access vaccines. In fact, last week I heard from a constituent, Alice Walker, whose mom, a senior, had to wait outside in the cold for over an hour to get vaccinated despite having an appointment. Mr. Speaker, it is clear that this government's vaccine rollout is disorganized and ignores equity needs in communities like mine in Scarborough and many other parts of the province. The budget announced yesterday was a disappointment for Scarborough. It ignored the needs of Scarborough healthcare needs, for example. Why was in Scarborough mentioned in the health care budget at all. Our infrastructures, Question. our buildings are the oldest in the province, Mr. Speaker, and yet this vaccine rollout is another disappointment. Can this government commit to a truly equitable vaccine strategy that is not one-size-fits-all and takes into account the unique and necessary needs of our communities like Scarborough and Northwest Toronto? Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Minister Hill. Speaker, there's a, a lot there, and I'll try and answer in the short time that I have available. But first of all, I would say that no part of Ontario has been for forgotten with our budget, including Scarborough. All hospitals in, across the province of Ontario have received a 3.4 percent increase, which has been recognized and acknowledged by Anthony Dale, the head of the uh, Ontario Hospital Association. He welcomes this investment, which will allow hospitals to respond to COVID patients, other patients, and vaccine rollouts. With respect with respect to the vaccine rollouts, our system, our booking system is robust. It has withstood uh, th hundreds of thousands of calls. As of yesterday, we had 551,000 over 700 appointments already booked on the system. If people are having problems accessing through the, the booking system, they are certainly welcome to call our on-call centre that they can receive assistance there for booking. But as for people not being able to receive bookings if they're inbound or homebound, that is absolutely not the case. We are going to make sure that everyone in Ontario that wants to receive a vaccine will receive a vaccine, whether that's through the assistance of their primary care provider or through their home and community visiting nurse. Everyone who wants one will get one, and our booking system and our customer care system will help them to be able to do that. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. And the government house leader has informed me he has a point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just rise uh, in accordance with Standing Order uh, 59, I believe it is, uh, just to outline uh, uh, the business uh, for next week and just to uh, thank colleagues for what has been a, a great week, uh, highlighted, of course, by the, uh, the budget of, uh, of the Minister of Finance. Uh, we will obviously start uh, next week, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, on the Monday morning with uh, PMB. As you know, this government uh, added uh, an extra PMB, uh, and that will take place on Monday morning again, as it has been for weeks. Uh, in the afternoon, we will uh, uh, continue on with uh, the budget uh, with the budget bill, and that is on the 29th. On the 30th, we will uh, again in the morning the budget bill. 
Uh, and in the afternoon session, we will continue with the, the budget. Uh, again, on the 30th, the morning of the 30th, we will continue with uh, the budget, um, followed by uh, Bill 257, uh, the Building Broadband Faster in the afternoon. Uh, on the morning of the 1st, Building Broadband Faster, uh, in, obviously in the morning, uh, and uh, in the afternoon, uh, back to uh, uh, the budget. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.